you have a better life in many respects than royalty did just three or four hundred years ago, which is really not a lot of time. Welcome back to another episode of the Nomads Notebook Podcast. My name is Joe Maxwell, and today I want to talk about happiness. I'm going to share the incredible story of a man named Eddie Jaku, who's become known as the happiest man on earth. I can guarantee that in some form, Eddie's story will change your outlook on life. And that's going to lead us into a bigger conversation about the concept of happiness, what it is exactly, and how we can find it. So if you haven't already noticed, I'm probably the biggest history nerd who you're ever going to meet. One of the things that's always shocked me as I study the past is just how nasty people can be to one another. The 20th century has illustrated this point probably better than any time period, particularly through the atrocities that were committed during World War II. The darkness of the Holocaust is something that the world will probably never fully heal from. But the more I study that event, the more that I continue to be encouraged by the stories of friendship, love, and human compassion that continually rose from the ashes during those dark, dark years. The story of Eddie Jaku fits this description probably better than any other I've ever read. During the 1930s, Eddie Jaku was an intelligent young man living in Leipzig, Germany. He had graduated from elementary school, and he was desperate to attend a good high school in order to pursue his natural interest in engineering. But then Hitler came to power in 1933, and this changed everything for Eddie and so many other Jews living in Germany. Now, it's important to understand the climate of Germany back in those days. Remember, it's the early 1930s. The defeat of World War I was still fresh in the minds of most of the German people. The government at that time was paying an enormous amount of money in reparations to the Allied countries. And that stress, combined with the effects of the Great Depression, left the German economy in a terrible state. Poverty and starvation just tore the nation apart. People were furious, and they were looking for someone to blame. Hitler gave that to them in the Jewish people. Anti-Semitic policies were instated almost immediately. Eddie wasn't allowed to have his bar mitzvah or even attend high school as he was so excited to do. But the Jeku family was a very determined group. They weren't ready to give up so easily. They knew that their son had a gift and they were going to do everything within their power in order to see him achieve his dreams. But in order to find a solution, they had to do something drastic. Eddie was going to have to leave home and assume a completely new identity in order to get the education that he wanted. So his father forged some papers and Eddie assumed the identity of an orphan named Walter. With this new identity, he got an engineering education, but he had to live in an orphanage nine hours from his parents' home. He didn't see his family for the next five years, and in that time, he very understandably grew incredibly lonely and isolated. After graduation, he decided to take an impromptu trip home. He just couldn't take the loneliness anymore. He had to see his family, so... He traveled home to Leipzig, but this would prove to be one of the most costly decisions of his entire life. Eddie came back home and essentially walked right into an event that's become known as Kristallnacht, or in English it's called the Night of the Broken Glass. Many Jewish homes and businesses were destroyed, and Eddie is walking around, he's taking this all in, and he's absolutely shocked. Just as he's doing that, he happens to be caught and arrested by the local Gestapo police, and he was brought to Camp Buchenwald along with his best friend, Kurt. The conditions in Buchenwald were absolutely appalling. Men were stacked into tiny bunks like a bunch of sardines. There was no toilet paper in the bathroom, so the prisoners had to wipe with their bare hands. But in the midst of all this horror, Eddie actually had an incredible stroke of luck. He ran into a soldier who worked at the camp who he knew from his previous time in school when he was staying at the orphanage. 
that soldier explained that his engineering skills could actually be really useful in factories outside of the camp, and he might actually be released under those grounds. He promised to talk to the camp commander on Eddie's behalf, and sure enough, a couple of weeks later, he was miraculously released from the camp under the single condition that he immediately report to a factory for work. So his father picked him up from the train station, but instead of going to the factory, they actually drove straight to the Belgian border in a desperate attempt to escape to England. They got to the outskirts of the Ardennes forest, and at that point, they had to leave their car behind and walk on foot through the forest in the darkness of night. They figured if they could just get through the woods safely and into Belgium, then it wouldn't be difficult to find their way to the coast, hop on a boat, and then they'd be free from this nightmare once they were in England. But things didn't go to plan. Eddie's father was actually caught, and the two of them became separated. Now, at this point, Eddie had no idea what was going on, and he just kept running. He wasn't able to find a boat on the coast as they had planned, but he actually did escape to southern France for a period of time, but after a few months, he too was eventually caught by some German guards and sent on a train that was bound for Auschwitz. Now, Eddie didn't know exactly where the train was going to be going at this point, but he figured it wasn't going to be going anywhere good. And just when he needed it most, he found another incredible stroke of luck. As he was boarding the train, he just so happened to be positioned in the train in the frontmost car, right beside the conductor's cabin. And in the conductor's cabin, he noticed a small screwdriver sitting on the floor right at the entrance of an open door. When the guards weren't looking, Eddie snatched that screwdriver, and once he was in his car and the train was rolling, he used it to pry loose some floorboards and jump off the train. Over the next couple of months, Eddie Jaku made his way back to Belgium. He knew it was going to be a long shot, but he was so desperate to find his family again. And amazingly, completely out of nowhere, he just ran into his best friend from Germany again, Kurt. Kurt had also escaped Buchenwald, and with the help of him, he was able to locate his entire family who were hiding in an attic in a home outside of the city of Brussels. His mother and sister had escaped Germany, and his father was also miraculously released from prison a few months earlier. So things seemed to be going in the right direction. Eddie moved into the attic with his family, and he described the next few months as the happiest moments of his entire life. They were cramped up in that attic, and they didn't have much in terms of material possessions, but they were together again, and that's all that really mattered for them at that time point. I think that the family had been through enough by now that they weren't going to take each other for granted. But as is so common with any moment of happiness in life, it was very fleeting for Eddie. A neighbor reported their location to the local Gestapo police, and they were immediately rounded up and put on a train that was headed for Auschwitz. And this time, there would be no escaping. Put yourself in Eddie's shoes for a minute. Imagine being completely betrayed like that by someone who, in a different time and place, probably would have been a friend. The feeling of injustice must have been overwhelming for him at that time. I've always been amazed by how quick people are to turn on each other when they're faced with a life and death situation. The trip to Auschwitz took nine days, and it was in the heat of the summer. 150 people were jammed into a single cattle car, the conditions were just appalling beyond anything we can imagine. They were given no food over nine days and only a single barrel of water. But amazingly, all but two people who were in Eddie's section survived, and this was thanks to the smart thinking of his father. Eddie's father came up with a rationing system where he would cut 150 squares of paper with one per person. Upon presenting their square of paper, Everyone was given one cup of water in the morning and then another one at night. It wasn't a lot of water, but it was enough to keep most everyone alive in that section. In many of the other cars, up to 50% of the people would die of dehydration before they even got to the camp. 
Auschwitz was so much worse than anything Eddie had experienced before. And you have to remember, by this point, he's seen a lot. Older prisoners were immediately sent to the gas chambers. Eddie lost both his parents within an hour of arriving at the camp without even a chance to say goodbye. The rest of the prisoners, Eddie included, were forced to do hard slave labor all day in the German mines and factories. Within a few weeks of this lifestyle, many would completely lose their will to live and they would run into the electric fence around the camp, killing themselves by electrocution. After losing his parents, Eddie too began to fall into a deep depression. And just when he was starting to lose his will to live, guess who showed up? It was his best friend, Kurt, who was living in another section of the camp. Kurt just seemed to have a knack for showing up at the right place and the right time. Eddie and Kurt looked after each other, they shared clothing and food, but most of all, they were an emotional backbone for each other, and this kept them alive. In January 1945, as the Soviet army closed in, the guards of Auschwitz emptied the camp and began marching the prisoners towards the mountains in an effort to cover up the atrocities that had happened. And you have to remember, this was the depths of winter in Poland. The prisoners were malnourished and only given a very thin layer of tattered clothing that protected them from the bitter cold. If they stopped marching at any point, then they were shot by the guards. After marching for 14 hours straight with no breaks on the first day, the group finally stopped at an abandoned building for the night. At this point, Eddie was actually doing surprisingly well considering everything that he'd been through, but Kurt was close to passing out from a lack of food and water. Moments before they were to set off again the next morning, Kurt told Eddie that he just couldn't go on. He didn't have the energy. Eddie knew that this would be a death sentence, and with everything he'd been through over the years, he just couldn't bear the thought of losing his best friend. It just wasn't an option. Eddie thought hard, and he searched around. He was frantic to find anything. And just when the guards started to yell to get everyone moving out of the building... He found his answer. In one corner of this abandoned old building was a rickety ladder leading up to a ceiling crawl space. It was going to be a long shot, but at this point, the two really had no choice. Eddie helped Kurt up the ladder, and he left him in there. And to his amazement, the guards didn't notice Kurt up there as they cleared out the building. Eddie then left with the rest of the group, and he did all that he could do. He prayed that one day he might see his dear friend again. Eddie eventually found himself on a train to a smaller camp that was further west and away from the Russian advance. The conditions in this new camp were actually quite a bit better than what he'd been used to in Auschwitz too. But now the American advance began approaching from the other side, so the guards of this camp as well decided to empty everyone out, and they began marching them north. This time, the guards had no plan. There was no other camp. The Allies had closed in on both sides, and there was just nowhere to go anymore. Eddie was marching, and he grew incredibly weak, and he had this sickening feeling that the guards were just going to line everyone up and shoot them. At this point, nothing else really made sense. With everything he'd been through, and how far he'd come, and with how close it was to the end of the war, Eddie just wasn't ready to give up. Almost like magic, as he's thinking this, another opportunity presented itself. Eddie spotted some drainage pipes beside the road. They were about three feet in diameter, so just big enough for him to climb inside and hide. He sat in there for hours, probably days. He was so delirious at this point that he didn't have a great concept of time. Icy water began flowing through the pipes, and it felt like a thousand little knives were stabbing him all over. Nighttime finally came, and just as Eddie was drifting off that first night, he heard the sound of German soldiers marching along the road right beside him. One of the soldiers, just on a whim, stopped and opened fire to clip from his submachine gun right into the drain pipe that Eddie was hiding in. A barrage of bullets ripped through the pipe. He heard them whizzing past him on either side, but amazingly... They missed him completely. Terrified and near death inside that drainage pipe, Eddie made a promise to God that if he let him live, 
He would be a force for good in the world, and he would never take his life for granted. The next morning, Eddie woke to the noise of a tank rumbling, and thinking it was more Germans, he braced himself for the worst. But something was a little different this time. He'd heard many German tanks by this point, and something sounded a little different in how the engine was working. He heard voices too, but as they got closer, they didn't really sound German. These men were actually speaking English, and he realized they were American soldiers. Eddie immediately ran out. He left his hiding place. The American soldiers immediately took him to the nearest hospital. He was free, but the clutches of death still lingered. When he checked into the hospital, he weighed just 60 pounds. He was sick with typhoid and cholera. The doctor who was taking care of him gave him just a 35% chance to live. But slowly, Eddie was a fighter, remember, he began to recover. He got on a regular diet again and he was treated for his illnesses. And after just six weeks, he left the hospital for Belgium in search of his family. But of course, there was no one waiting for him there. Like so many survivors, Eddie felt much more pain after the war rather than relief. Just when things seemed hopeless and by pure chance, Eddie ran into his dearest friend, Kurt. Kurt had been rescued from his sealing hiding place by the Russian army a few days after Eddie had left him in there. The two gave each other a new reason to live. They rented an apartment together and they slowly began the very painful process of rebuilding their lives. Eddie met a woman named Floor in 1946 and it was absolutely love at first sight. The two were married within a few months of meeting, but things didn't get easier right away. The first couple of years of their marriage was actually incredibly difficult. Eddie was suffering from all kinds of complex traumas from the experiences that he'd been through. He was just in survival mode for so long that it was hard for him to just slow down and enjoy a regular life again. But this all changed when Floor gave birth to their first son, Michael. Eddie looked into the eyes of his newborn baby boy, and he realized in a moment just how lucky he was to be alive. A few years earlier, if anyone had told him that he would be married with a child, he would have never believed them, and yet here he was. Fast forward to 1950, Eddie and his wife decided to start a new life in Australia. He found a great job there, they bought a house, and they raised a family. In 2020, Eddie turned 100 years old and celebrated 75 years of marriage with Floor. The two of them passed away in 2021 and 22 respectively after an incredibly rich life full of love and happiness. The first thing that strikes me about this incredible story is just how lucky Eddie was. There were so many events along the way where he narrowly escaped death. When I read about stories like this, it makes me believe that there must be more than meets the eye here on Earth. It's almost like someone or something was looking out for Eddie, knowing the remarkable story that he would later share with the world. So what can Eddie teach us about happiness? Back to our original question. Specifically what it is and what it's not. Well, one of the biggest things that stands out to me about Eddie's story is just how happy he was in those few months when he and his family were hiding in that small attic in Belgium. If you remember, he actually described that period of time as the happiest moments of his entire life. That's an incredible statement to make, right? Like, this guy lived a long, long life. The Jeku family in that time had very little as far as material possessions, but they did have a couple of other things. They were together, for one, and they also had a newfound perspective that the togetherness that they were enjoying could so easily fall apart due to the threats that were facing them. So that probably left them much more grateful than they would have otherwise been. What this tells me about happiness is that it's not related to material possessions. With that said, I do believe that money can provide a certain level of satisfaction up to the point where basic needs are taken care of. But beyond that, the returns are really diminishing. 
what is the point where basic needs are taken care of, right? That's going to vary from person to person. For some, it's maybe 60000 a year. For other people, it's maybe 250000 a year. It's just going to depend on your lifestyle expectations. So what is happiness then? Based on Eddie's incredible story, you can break happiness down into two sources. The first one is love. When was Eddie most happy? What was present? It was always some form of love, whether that was the love of his family, the love of his best friend, Kurt, and later his wife and children. Love was always what pushed him to never give up when he was in the depths of despair in Auschwitz. And it also really helped him to build a new life after an unimaginably traumatic experience. So what does that mean for us now? To me, it's a constant reminder that we need to continually invest in the relationships of those around us. One of the most difficult things that I've noticed about becoming an adult is we naturally seem to drift away from those who are closest to us. We move away from friends and family and begin the process of building our own lives. And in the midst of that chaos, relationships can take a back seat. And before we know it, we've gone months, maybe even years without talking to our loved ones and building those relationships. Now, I'm someone who's extremely productivity focused, sometimes to a fault, I'll admit that. So I have to continually tell myself that besides work, fitness, meal prep, meditation, podcasting, golf, and all these other pursuits that I have, investing in those around me is one of the most important things that I can do in life. The second source of happiness is perspective. Up until the point his son was born, Eddie Jaku was a broken man. Remember, he was struggling with these traumas in his past. But the moment he saw his newborn son, it shifted his perspective. He thought back to his nightmarish life in Auschwitz and how at that point he couldn't comprehend the fact that he might get married and have children just two short years later. This memory allowed him to approach his current life with more gratitude and ultimately led him down a path of joy and satisfaction. Now, like I said, none of us are going to be able to even come close to comprehending what Eddie experienced in those camps. And that's something that we can be very grateful for. But we can still apply this principle of perspective to our own lives. Just the other night, I was doing some breath work and I found my mind wandering back to some memories from a couple of years ago. At that time, I was incredibly unhappy. My job was stressful and I hated it. I didn't like the city I was living in. I was thousands of miles away from my family and I missed them very deeply. As I was breathing, I felt just a taste of these emotions again. And I'll be honest, it was very painful for me. But I then considered where I am in life right now. While things still aren't perfect and there's plenty that I'm still working on, it really hit me in that moment just how far I've come. That led to an intense feeling of gratitude for my current situation and the inevitable peace that comes from that emotion. You can apply this principle outside of just your own life too. I'm going to say with complete confidence that if you are listening to this right now, you are more wealthy and comfortable than 90% of the world's population today. You have clothes on your back, a roof over your head, and plenty of nice foods to eat. And I know we're so quick to disregard these basics, but a huge portion of the world just can't afford to actually take these things for granted because they don't have them readily available. Historically speaking, it's even more exaggerated. You have a better life in many respects than royalty did just three or 400 years ago, which is really not a lot of time. But even knowing all that, I'm gonna be the first to admit that I'm quick to gripe and complain about things that most of the world would laugh at. I'm guilty. But the reality is, when I look at how things actually are on a worldwide global scale, I realize that I've already won the lottery with the life that I've been given. Life is an incredible opportunity, but it's far too short to live unhappily. So I'd like to wrap things up there, how I always do, with a quote. Happiness cannot be traveled to, owned, earned, worn, or consumed. Happiness is the spiritual experience of living every minute with love, grace, and gratitude. Thanks for listening.